Hi, welcome to JavaScript Jam. I'm Ishan Nand, CTO at Layer Zero. And I'm Mark Bercato, VP of Engineering at Layer Zero. On today's episode of uh, JavaScript Jam, we got a really special session. We've got uh, two engineers from the Chrome team and from Google here to talk about all things Core Web Vitals. We have Annie Sullivan, who's a software engineer from the Chrome Web Platform team, and we have Katie Hempenius, from uh, who does DevRel on the Core Web Vitals team. Uh, Annie and Katie, welcome to JavaScript Jam. Thanks. Excited to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So you know, before we jump into Core Web Vitals, uh, just you know, help us get started by understanding you know a little bit about your background and what your your day to day is like at at Google. Uh, I can go first. I'm. Uh... I'm the TL of the team, the, the lead of the team that does uh, the actual implementation of the metrics. Like the, we decide what metrics to do, we design them, and then we implement them in Chrome as web standards. Uh, so there's about seven people on the team and a lot of my day to day is spent like in uh, just going through emails and like kind of reading through discussions about like uh, different trade-offs in metrics design, uh, trade-offs between users and developers, trade-offs between uh, different uh implementation ideas uh different audiences and um also like working with the individual team members that are leading the various projects and trying to figure out you know how do we move it forward what's the next step and before so coming of emails, to oh, sorry oh, go ahead lots of emails lots of meetings <laughs> do you ever get a chance to write any code in, in all of that uh herding of cats uh, yeah, I get, I get to write a little bit of code. I have maybe like a one CL a rate, uh, one CL a week rate. And um, I write a lot of queries, uh, which don't quite count as code, but that's uh, where most of my, my typing uh, technical stuff goes. Cool. Uh, Katie, how about yourself? Um, yeah, so I work on uh, DevRel for Core Web Vitals. And I guess how I kind of think about that is like we have these Core Web Vitals metrics that have been defined. Like how do those get applied to, uh, to, in a way such that, you know, it makes the web faster um, and kind of trying to figure out like what the pain points are for um, either from tooling or like how you should be writing code to meet Core Web Vitals. Um, so what I work on is a mixture of, um, you know, giving you know feedback to teams like Annie's. Um, I work a little bit with some of the teams at Google with uh, helping them make their products faster. And then also working on things like, you know, putting together guidance on, you know, say for instance, fonts or autoplay carousels, um, things like that, where people are hitting pain points around web vitals. Okay, cool. So let's, let's just jump into it for, you know, level set for audience members who aren't familiar with core vitals. Can you describe, you know, what Core of Vitals is, you know, what the three metrics are and, and why they're so important? Katie, do you want to go ahead and your developer relations? You probably... Yeah, um, the three uh, Core of Vitals metrics are uh, largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift. Um, and each of them basically looks at a different aspect of the page experience. So uh, largest contentful paint is kind of like approximating like the loading speed, you know, is it useful to the user? Can they read anything um, quickly? And then uh, first input delay is looking at the responsiveness of the page. So for instance, if you've ever been in a situation where you're like, you're like clicking the button and it's not doing anything, so you probably just keep clicking the button more, that would be an example of a page that isn't responsive. And usually that, that situation arises because there's just too much JavaScript on the page and like the, the browser can't keep up because it's so busy. Uh, you know, executing that JavaScript. Um, and that's what first input delay uh, measures. And then lastly, cumulative layout shift is looking at the layout stability of the page. So if a, the, the page has a stable layout, like nothing should be jumping around unexpectedly. Um, and an example of that not being the case is, um, I don't know, particularly like if you're reading like long articles maybe, and all of a sudden like an ad pops in or something and it just pushes everything down the page and you have to refine where you were reading. That'd be an example of a layout shift. And like, for instance, we're seeing a lot of that lately with like cookie banners, like you're looking at the page and every, all of a sudden everything jumps around because the cookie banner was added. Um, so those are the three metrics. And I think a little bit of the, the backstory, I think the impetus there is 
uh, like I've been interested in performance forever. Um, well, not forever, but for a while. And for a long time, it was just like, there were so many different metrics out there that you could use to approximate performance. Like just even trying to like pick one to focus on uh, could really be a project in and of itself. So I think uh, one of the nice things about Core Web Vitals is it gives a little bit of structure around like, okay, this is how we're, we're defining performance and here are some North stars to, to shoot for. So most audience members are probably familiar with Lighthouse. Could you just like compare and contrast Lighthouse with Core Web Vitals? Yeah, Lighthouse is a performance tool. It's a lab-based tool, which means that like, you know, you do a run in Lighthouse and it, it you know, checks your page. And then it gives you a bunch of information. It gives you a score overall about how you're doing. It gives you individual performance metrics, including the Core Web Vitals. And it gives you a lot of uh, things like audits and uh checks that, that help you determine like what are the best ways that you can improve the page. Uh, the thing that we wanted to do with Core Web Vitals that goes a little bit uh, beyond what Lighthouse does is we really wanted to make sure that uh, when we're measuring like our page is actually having a great user experience, we wanted to look at two things really in particular. First, uh, what are real users in the real world seeing? So we're looking not at lab data like Lighthouse shows, but uh, we're measuring the Core Web Vitals in the field. Uh, over the whole population of users. And second, we wanted to, to just, like, if we're only looking at, like, um, if, if people are only going to look at a couple of metrics, we wanted them to be uh, user experience focused. So largest content we'll paint is kind of like, when did the main content display? Uh, and same with cumulative layout shifts. It's actually measuring that shifts are happening and how bad they are. So directly related to what the user is seeing, as opposed to some performance metrics are more technical and they, they're kind of more measuring that you're using best practices. So, you know, just to follow up on this, how should people treat the Lighthouse performance score? You know, that number at the top of PageSpeed Insights moving forward. Because one of, I'll tell you, one of my pet peeves is uh, the UX of, of PageSpeed Insights, you know, emphasizes the performance score at the top. And then actually right below it, you have Core Web Vitals. And then right below it, you have the Lighthouse Synthetic. And the one at the top is Synthetic. So it's like Synthetic, real user data, then Synthetic again. And it, it doesn't, I mean, it has little notices, but it really emphasizes that Synthetic number at the top, uh, which, you know, people just, especially non-technical stakeholders who, who, you know, they know performance is important, but they don't understand these details, tend to gravitate whatever's at the top of the page and whatever is biggest. So how should people treat that moving forward? Um, I guess I would say is like use Lighthouse is a tool to help you. Um, and if, you, but if your goal is Core Web Vitals, you should be focusing on the Core Web Vitals, like information that Lighthouse is reporting rather than the Lighthouse score. Um, and I can actually give a little bit more, if I share my screen, I can give a little bit more context on the sure. Lighthouse score. The Lighthouse score is basically a blend of a couple different um, metrics. Let's see if this works. Um... Uh, so here you can see exact visualization of like the different metrics that go into ultimately um, the, the Lighthouse score that you get and the Lighthouse score calculations have, have kind of evolved over the years. Um, but ultimately, I would say use Lighthouse as a tool. It can help you find room for improvement. But ultimately, if you care about Web Vitals, the only thing that's going to matter in terms of and I'm saying this, if you care about Web Vitals in the context of like say search ranking and stuff like that, ultimately the only thing that matters is the performance that you're delivering to your users rather than whatever Lighthouse is, is measuring. So just to follow up on that, you know, there's the seven metrics here, no six, uh, off by one classic programmer. Uh, of these, LCP has a direct correlate in LCP, the largest contentful paid in Core Web Vitals. Uh, so does cumulative layout shift. Uh, do you want to tell people what they should do about first input delay? Because uh, there isn't kind of a, a correlate here. Well, there is sort of. Um, but do you want to just help explain uh, how to? Yeah. Bid um, so one of the challenges edit? with uh, measuring first input delay in a lab environment is that it, you can't really do it because it's uh, measured based on when a user interacts with the page. And so in a lab environment, you're not going to have that interaction. And so what can be a decent proxy for that is looking at total blocking time. Um, then 
actual measurement you know is going to be different so like you can't compare one to one total blocking time with first input delay but they are positively correlated um because they're both kind of reflecting on how occupied the main thread is and i'm gonna get on my soapbox a little bit about tti i'm, I'm not a big fan of that metric and I've actually, at least in, in say, the e-commerce space, I've graphed out the Internet Retailer 500, the, you know, the TTI versus the actual FID. And they're, they're aligned in aggregate, uh, but they aren't, like, for individual users, I'd, I'd really feel like you should look at your core of vital scores first before you figure out what you want to perfect on your lighthouse is kind of one of the recommendations I've given to a lot of uh, clients and folks uh, who run on our platform is look at that first before you try to focus on on Lighthouse and then look at the, you know, look at TTI and, and TBT if your fit happens to be bad. Uh, but in some cases, it doesn't, it doesn't correlate. Um, the last thing I just want to say on this is uh, we, not to bury the lead, but, you know, the number one thing about Core of Vitals that's really critical that everyone needs to know is you guys Google announced publicly a year ago, basically, and it goes live this month. Uh, core Web Vitals are now going to be used as ranking factors in your, you know, your position on the search engine results page. So speed, in theory, has historically meant better conversion for whatever your site does. But now speed means actually free traffic uh, from, you know, the number one search engine. So that's that's a huge uh, priority for almost everybody on the Internet. And that's why it's, you know, really so important. So I'd like to dive into a little bit about the process of how these metrics are developed. And at layer zero, the majority of new applications launched on our platform are single page apps. And one of the metrics that's somewhat problematic, at least historically for single page apps is cumulative layout shift. Because as the user navigates through the app, unless the app is really fast, it will register a bunch of layout shifts as you go from page to page. Um, and so the initial kind of definition of CLS would essentially grow, the layout shift score would just grow and grow and grow until it reached infinity. Um, but I know you guys have iterated on that and there's a new version of that. So I guess my question is, what is that process like for iteration? And then maybe dive a little bit into specifically with CLS, what are the changes that have been made and how do those changes come about? Yeah, so when we iterate, basically, like at a high level, what we do is we, we have a problem, right? Like either we want to measure user experience or we have a developer issue with the metric. And then we do a whole lot, like a little bit of implementation to make sure we can measure like what we want to understand. And then we do a whole lot of analysis. First, we kind of look manually at web pages and try to like understand them as I'm sitting at the computer, like is this metric spitting out the right thing? And then we look at scale. Uh, so I can, and you know, we have our, our data from Chrome about like what every web page is, is doing and, and we can kind of like look at outliers and things like that. Uh, so the thing that happened with cumulative layout shift is we started to get developer complaints like it is really difficult for single page apps uh, that are open for a really long time that the score goes up a lot. And uh, we did an analysis because we do know uh, in the Chrome metrics like oh how long is the page open and we did an analysis and we didn't find a huge number of pages that like that were open for a super long time and had this issue, but we saw like a big variation. And when we looked at individual sites uh, that had, that were open for a long time, we felt like uh, that, that it did seem like that the metric probably wasn't too fair to those sites. And I think it's really important that, uh, that we work really hard in order to try to be more fair to all the sites, even if like it doesn't kind of show up in the overall statistics. So that, that's why that we decided we were going to do something about this problem. And so one thing we did uh, to start was we took a bunch of different web pages. Uh, so we took a bunch of like pages from directly from developer complaints. This person says like, okay, I have a single page app and I'm trying to do a transition. Here's the app. Here's the transition. This is why uh, I feel the metric is unfair. We had some examples of things, but you know, at the beginning when we invented the metric, like what, what did we want to catch? Uh, and then we did like that analysis that I talked about where we looked at real world data and what are the sites actually doing. And one thing that we found stood out a lot, uh, for example, was uh, infinite scrollers. Let's say you have a tiny footer and the page is scrolling and the, the footer just shifts a little bit as more content loads in. Uh, and it's a little annoying, but it doesn't add up to like infinite annoyance. So we took all these different user experience, single page apps, infinite scrolls, non-infinite scrolls, uh, things we knew we felt should be annoying people. 
um we did a user study to try and rank like like how how much like, good experiences and bad experiences that that we had from examples like how much do users actually feel those are good and bad experiences and we ranked this kind of set of 50 sites and we had a lot of different ideas about what we might do to to make make things more fair to long with pages. The, the most obvious idea is just like the average layout shift, right? You take the time spent on the page and then you divide it by the, the sum of the layout shift. Uh, there were a bunch of ideas about how we might break the layout shifts into windows. And then once we had such windows, like what could we do uh, about them? Could we, um, could we, what statistic might we report on them? Uh, there are also other ideas like, what if you just reported like the worst single layout shift? So we took all of these ideas and we implemented them and as we we had basically what we did with these these manual test cases was we recorded uh, the layout shift and showed that uh, we recorded a video of it that we showed to users, but we also recorded a Chrome trace which has all the data about um, like what layout shifts are happening, and we scored all these different versions of the metric uh, based on how closely they rated to what the users said about like how bad this site is, and then we came up with kind of a top three. They all tended to be uh, windowing strategies to max windows and an average window. And uh, we implemented those in Chrome and we looked at scale. Okay, now that we have the, the data for like kind of all the URLs uh, above a certain threshold of usage, uh, how did the different strategies that we came up compare? What are the sites that they ranked most differently from each other and that they would rank most differently from uh, cumulative layout shift? And we looked at like kind of like uh, if you explain like what the website's trying to do, um, so, or, or what what what's the difference kind of in English? Like uh, if we have a really small window and the web page loads really slowly, you could chunk the layout shifts into groups. So that was bad. So we wanted the window to kind of expand to cover that. Um, but then we also looked at like you know how does it handle like some of the differences were in how they handled infinite scrollers and things like that. So uh, we we kind of looked at all of of the data that came back from that. And we also like, as soon as we started to implement these things uh, in Chrome, we wrote a blog post about like what we're implementing and why, and we asked for developer feedback and we got a lot of helpful developer feedback as well. And that kind of uh, got our choice to specifically Safshin Windows. We got a lot of positive feedback about that. So we took the data from the manual user study, uh, implemented everything, did a user study at scale uh, about what how the metrics differ it took developer feedback and that's how we came to the next version of cls gotcha and is that version of cls like live right now in the in the field data uh yes it is cool okay awesome um so do you find that that cls is the metric of the three that maybe people struggle with the most or is that more confined to spas versus maybe there are other metrics of the three that are more problematic I think it actually really, really varies per site, like which metric is most difficult. And the, the thing that I find um, correlates most with like, like how are, are you going to have difficulty with a certain thing is like the components on your page. Like, you know, did, did you use fonts? Did you have a carousel? Carousels can be complicated. Katie's written a bunch of really fantastic articles about different, um, like diff tough issues that sites might have on their page that might cause some specific, but it depends on like <laughs> which components uh, you have on your page would kind of uh, predict which metrics you might have trouble with in my experience. Gotcha. Like Katie, does, do you think that there's any particular like framework or tools that are not good to use? Like when optimizing for core web vitals is, is a framework important? Uh, I would say that's not, like the top issue. Um, and for example, um, if you are curious about like how many sites are passing web vitals, the HTTP, HTTP archive has that data. Um, and if you look at that, it's actually LCP is what the most amount of sites are struggling with. Um, mm -hmm. And the one, the one weird thing about working with this data is it's broken down by like poor, what do we call it, adequate or something and good. And so it's like, do you, do you look at the amount of sites that are passing? Do you look at the amount of sites with bad performance? But arguably, um, most sites struggle with LCP. Um, and I think part of that is I think uh, it's actually like LCP is like fairly easy. Like I, I hate to call it easy like to optimize for it. But I mean, you basically figure out what the LCP element is and then work back from there to figure out you know, is it not being discovered quickly? Does it need to be compressed more? You know, do we using a resource hint? Um, 
Uh, but I think we hear a lot about CLS just because it's new. Like there have been, there, there is largest paint, there's first continental paint. There's a lot, like the idea of looking at paints has been around for a really long time. So I think LCP as an idea isn't very new, but I think we tend to hear a lot about CLS because, you know, prior to Web Vitals, I don't think it was something that anyone was talking about, even though it's a very legitimate, you know, phenomenon that's been going on forever. Um, do you have a sense of like what maybe like the most common culprits for LCPR? Is it literally just a slow backend, or is it some script that's blocking the main image from rendering? Um, no, I think it's like discoverability. So like maybe your hero image is injected by some line of code that's buried within like your your application code, and it's a lot of JavaScript, and so that has to get downloaded and executed before even that like you know HTML tag gets injected into the page, and then the image gets requested. Um, so it's, or, you know, maybe the, the background image is applied by a style sheet and the style sheet goes through, you know, a couple of request change before mm. it arrives. So it's a lot of, in my opinion, that's the biggest thing. Um, there are definitely are cases where, uh, the image is too big or it should be compressed or, you know, using source set. Um, but I would say probably discoverability is the, the single biggest one. What do you, you know, along the same lines, what do you find are the biggest, you know, misunderstandings about core of vitals that you have found from developers who are trying to, you know, improve their scores? I think lab versus field is definitely the biggest one. Like, where is the score coming from at, at a high level? Um, and just to clarify, I guess, for anyone listening who isn't familiar with that terminology, the lab would be using tools like Lighthouse, which are not actually reflecting an actual user's experience. They might be simulating as, as well as possible, but they're not an actual user. And then field data would be whatever the performance is of an actual user. Um, and like kind of continuing on that point, I think uh, there are so, so many ways in which lab data can be different from field data. So almost like using your imagination to figure out like all the possible ways like you could be overlooking why your, your Lighthouse score is different than like a field score. Um, for instance, like uh, one example is like probably yes, most of the time maybe your, hero, your above the fold hero image is the LCP element. Yeah. But keep in mind, like you might have hyperlinks on your page that go down, you know, further down. And so they might, you know, those users might be getting a completely different LCP element, just like thinking through, or like, um, are you testing cookie diverse or cookie banner versus non cookie bannered flows? Um, like all these like little permutations um, ultimately can make a big difference on something like LCP or all yeah, the other so core web vitals metrics. To translate this out to, you know, users, going back to pay, you know page speed insights it would be like you could have a a great performance score but you're still not passing core vitals or vice versa you have a very poor performance score at the top of page speed insights but it says you're passing core vitals and it's because lighthouse is just running a simulation on you know your servers and core vitals is gathered anonymously from people actually browsing on their chrome devices and then aggregating those together so it's like it's a population that you're considering and not a single single user. Um, so, you know, what about uh, so that's definitely, I think, in our case, uh, you know, one of the most common things we've encountered as well. Uh, another one, though, you know, we've encountered is that like post load versus first load, uh, especially when it comes to CLS. Is that also a, a common kind of misunderstanding as well? Oh, yeah, I've had so many conversations with people like, oh, I, I the page is loaded. I didn't realize that, you know, this was counting. Um, and I think the fact that Lighthouse currently only looks at like the load experience probably magnifies that. So yeah, remember to keep the entire life cycle in line. What about confounders in uh, besides post and, and on load? But like, for example, uh, I know back in, uh, before you guys had core vitals, you still had uh, real, you know, Chrome user experience port data. And it was, you know, for like each of these metrics, it was good, poor, fair, roughly analogous. And, you know, somebody went and plotted it out on Stack Overflow. And the folks who had the best scores in Chrome user experience report all happened to be like in countries that had fast internet. Um, so it's also affected by like the internet speed of your audience and, there, do you ever run into like confounders like that also uh, also being, you know, uh, a particular source of issues or usually that's not as big an issue? 
it's surprisingly less of an issue than we thought when we went and started the program. Uh, we, I think internet speeds have gotten quite a bit faster around the world as uh, over the past few years. And um, like when we look at overall, like when a user is using their device and loading web pages in, in a given country, like the, the pages for the users in one country don't actually vary a lot from the page, the page load times of a, a user in another country. Really? Oh, wow. I'm, so like, I've, I've listened to a lot of like talks from like Alex Russell talks a lot about how like folks in, in other countries, uh, in addition to internet speed, right? There's the processing speed of devices. And he's yeah. like, your iPhone that you developers are developing with does not reflect you know, what the general public in other parts of the world has in terms of performance, especially when it comes to executing JavaScript. Um, and, but you're saying in general that you don't see those differences tend to manifest I think that, that the two things are true at the same time. Like, I, yeah. I think the network has gotten better. JavaScript is still an issue. But when people are on those phones in those different countries and they're seeing the same speeds, they're maybe not looking at the same sites. Uh, so sites that are popular in one country are kind of like adapted to to be good enough for the users in that country if that makes sense got it they calibrate to their audience yeah okay so maybe that's a good segue what i was thinking about is that you know the we have the saying that javascript was eating the world and i think in the last decade javascript done ate the world <laughs> uh so you know the, the story of the last decade in web development i think has been everybody moving everything to javascript rendering the whole page in javascript whether it's on the server or on the client um, with frameworks like React and Angular and Vue and now Svelte, um, you know, everybody's been flocking to these JavaScript heavy solutions and spas uh, and PWAs. Like, it seems like those are kind of at odds with some of the core web vitals. Like the more JavaScript you add to a page, the less likely your fit is going to be good and the more likely you're going to screw up something that makes your LCP bad and more dangerous with cumulative layout shift. Does, does Google have any like advice or perspective on that, like this tension of everybody going more towards JavaScript, but that slowing down the web and, and providing this poor experience? I think the, the, the big goal for the core of those metrics, right, is that we want to measure like the actual user experience and try like as a metric, not to be so prescriptive about like how people should do things. So if somebody comes up with a crazy interesting JavaScript for first uh, idea and it's super fast, then it'll measure well and that'll be great. But hopefully there, you know, like there's data on different frameworks and different TMSs and things like that. And, and you can kind of choose one based on, you know, like, like what the, how, how it works for your site. Katie, do you want to add on to that? And <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think like JavaScript frameworks are inherently bad. I mean, from my viewpoint, I think one of the reasons why JavaScript frameworks have gotten so popular is like they are a framework. There's a little bit of structure and guardrails and you're not just like sitting there with an empty editor, like starting from absolute scratch. And so I think that can also be applied as a, to help performance. Um, like, you know, I, like Shuby's been working on different projects where like, now starting to bake like performance features into the frameworks themselves. So I think depending on how you use them, frameworks can help or hurt. Gotcha. So I want to circle back a little bit to spas since that's an area that I'm super interested in. Like, we should define what spas are. Yeah, so spa uh, meaning single page application. So typical like new style application where Every time the user clicks a link, the URL changes, but the whole page doesn't reload. There's just a request for some data, and then the page is redrawn on the client. So spas are supposed to be this kind of cheat code for making navigation really fast because there's less work the browser has to do. But it seems like in the current iteration of Core Web Vitals, you don't get credit for that cheat, <laughs> it's in a sense. Like especially, like, CLS is one thing, but LCP even. LCP is really only measured when you land on the site, whether it's from Google or just from the user typing into the URL bar. You, one could argue that in order to capture really what you're trying to capture with LCP, you should be taking a different measurement for every navigation, whether it's client side or server side. Um, well, there's obviously a reason why that's not done. Why is that not done? Why is that not how LCP is calculated? Yeah, so really actually automatically determining what is a single page app navigation and what is JavaScript on the page doing something else is really, really difficult. Uh, 
we actually like we we looked at like different ways of measuring it and you know some of the ways we look at like uh if you think about oh it's just that like the url changes right and then something happens like uh, up to 15 percent of url changes like might not even have like a subsequent paint like that there's nothing happening after that url change so that there's no like really clear and defined way to uh to understand this, what exactly is a single page app navigation we're doing a lot of research into the area but it's it's gonna have to be like more of a long-term project gotcha yeah, I just, I, I want to, you know, take a step back and just underscore how important, like, at least Mark and I feel like on this, uh, it's, and when, when I try to extrapolate it as to what you guys are trying to do with Core Vitals, you're, you're trying to get the web to compete with native apps on the same device. And, you know, we look at the space and we feel like spas are the best hope, you, you know, help me Obi-Wan, you're my only hope uh, on the web, uh, maybe short of a framework like AMP which has a lot of great prefetching features built into it. Um, and so it's a bit ironic that the the best hope we have feels like it doesn't get full credit for all the things it does. So, um, you know, with that, you know, you guys have said you're going to be updating Core Web Vitals or reserving the right to change it every year. Um, can you give us a sense of what you're considering? Like, will FCP become a Core Web Vital? Possibly I, Google I.O. this year. Uh, there was a talk where smoothness and responsiveness were hinted at. Uh, it was clearly very early research. Um, but, you know, and, and with having followed this for a while, I, I, I know what reading the tea leaves is like. And it wasn't a surprise to me when the Coral Vitals came out because I was like, oh, these are some of the same metrics they've, they've talked about for a few years. Can you give us a sense of like where we might expect Coral Vital, you know, metrics changes to emerge? Yeah, definitely. So um, one thing that my team has been doing, like we wrote a blog post on the CLS research and that when uh, that was really helpful for us, like people understood what we were doing and they gave us a lot of feedback. And that's one thing we're really trying to do is make sure that we do get developer feedback and we understand, um, you know, like what some edge cases or, or problems or pain points with the metrics could be. And so we're going to write a series of blog posts on things we're considering. Uh, we just released uh, earlier today a blog post about responsiveness metrics and how we want to evolve first input delay in the future. Uh, we're going to write a uh, blog post about uh, uh, the long-term planning around single-page apps and the different options for what we might do to to better handle them. And we'll also, like uh, further down the road, give some progress on our, our smoothness work. Uh, FCP is another thing that we're considering. I think the biggest thing that we are keeping in mind with all of these is like, you can only have so many metrics, right? Like every metric adds developer overhead and every metric makes it like less possible to meet all of them, right? I, I, if you, you have a good metric that, you know, you want to add it because you want to encourage people to improve it, then you could cut away, right? At like, mm -hmm. like the number of sites that are meeting all of them and you don't want to push that down so that it's impossible. So, um, like, for example, if we added FCP as a metric, we'd have, that would be saying that like page load time, initial page load is really, really, really important. Yeah. <laughs> and it's more important than what happens after you load the page. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out like exactly how do we want to think about those things? And, uh, that that's kind of where we're at right now. Oh, so great to hear about the blog post that just came out today, hot off the presses. I'll, and I'll look forward to the spa one. Uh, but does that mean to translate, you know, extrapolate what you're saying? We could see Core Web Vitals metrics get retired, you know, from year to year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that okay. is a possibility. Uh, interesting. Well, I look forward to to hearing more on what you guys do there. Um, one thing I know from, you know, the curating the Core Web Vitals newsletter was a big debate on the developer community on the future of AMP now that it's no longer required for the top stories carousel. Um, are there lessons from AMP that are being incorporated into Core Web Vitals? Um, do you have a sense of, you know, what what developers could take away from that uh, in a, you know, Core Web Vitals post AMP world? Um, so I don't necessarily say it's like a post AMP world per yeah. se. Um, it's no longer a requirement for the carousel, but like I, yeah. I think AMP has virtues in and of itself. Um, uh, I completely tool. agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, for some people, it's a good tool. And for some people, like, it's not the right thing for them. Um, uh, I know, I think AMP is working on uh, making some of the components available so you can use the components themselves without AMP. Um, and I think that's a neat idea. 
Um, the other thing is like maybe seeing greater adoption of signed exchanges or having signed exchanges kind of play a role similar to AMP. Um, and I guess for those who don't have context on signed exchanges, um, signed exchanges um, basically like package up uh, a site or content in a way that um, the browser is able to tell where that content originated from. And therefore kind of the content becomes like portable and much more cacheable. And therefore you can start having like almost near instant page loads because um, the, the content can be served like from a, from a cache, so. Um, and with signed exchanges, like actually the, the browser can prefetch the content when the link scrolls into view in the Google search results, right? Yes, and I guess, so that's the, the other benefit of signed exchanges is um, though like prefetch is great for delivering stuff quickly, um, you are prefetching content from the origin server. And so you are exposing a certain amount of information to the origin server, you know, I mean, you're just making a normal request, but like that is, you know, hitting their servers. And so yeah. uh, with sign exchanges, the idea is you can now have privacy preserving prefetch because now that information is not hitting the origin servers until like that content is actually viewed. And so um, it's possible to be like uh, prefetch more content um, without uh, being, I guess, so concerned about the about um, the amount of data being disclosed. Because um, yeah. I think with the current prefetching model, you want to be somewhat conservative about how much prefetching you're doing. You don't want to be prefetching content that a, a user is never going to to use or look at. And that would, even like privacy aside, that would put a lot more uh, strain on the origin servers too. If you were prefetching from the origin servers directly rather from Google's cache. Every time you showed up in a search result, you'd have a request instead of actually waiting for the user to click on it. Um, so if I have it right then, with signed exchanges and prefetching, that could really help with LCP, right? If the content is all prefetched, it takes the network out of the equation as you're transitioning to the site. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm like trying to remember the statistics, and I think I remember them correctly, but I don't want to say them in case I, I don't get them right. But I know Nikkei was testing this out, and my understanding was correctly like they have a very optimized CDN setup and everything, um, but still using signed exchanges. I want to say shaved 300 milliseconds off, um, which may not seem like a lot, but I think, uh, yeah, this was already like a pretty optimized setup. So to take 300 milliseconds off of that was pretty significant. And this is live now, right? This is supported today. Yes. For all um, frameworks. All frameworks. Uh, AMP has its own tooling for it, but that's just yeah. because AMP has its own tooling for everything. But yeah, um, uh, if you want to do signed exchanges, um, there's a couple different, they're all open source tools. And basically what they do is they package up your content and serve it as a signed exchange. Um, and then uh, if you want to use signed exchanges with Google, basically you would set it up. So when the Google bot comes by, it knows that, your site serves signed exchanges, it'll load the signed exchange and then cache it. And then for users who are looking for your site on Google search, if it does have the signed exchange, it would serve the signed exchange version. So I wanna just pause for a second and just underscore this because I don't think people really appreciate how big a deal this is. This is like one of those things that gave AMP its magical feel. You tapped on the link, it loaded instantly. It was like faster than was physically possible from the network. And now you guys are bringing this to any framework and it's it's supported either coming soon or it's supported today. Um, and it basically means that your page is being served from Google's cache when somebody's coming out of the, the search engine results page, which means that first load coming off a of search is gonna be so fast. Uh, I think it's really great. I'm really excited uh, to see it getting more adoption. It was like, I think about two or three years ago, I gave a, a talk at, uh, Cascadia JS, and I was like, if, even if you don't like AMP or if you love AMP, you know, you should just support these open standards that the AMP team is is really pushing forward, like signed exchanges and portals. Uh, and it's it's really great to see. So I'm really excited about signed exchanges. Do you have a sense of the adoption of signed exchanges? Is it still pretty early and not widely used, or? Uh, it's pretty early about that. I have some meetings I think about that this week. Um, I know. Uh, I think it's still pretty early because I think it's only been probably within the past month or two that Google search has supported it. Um, but 
I, I do know off the top of my head, like a couple big companies that you would recognize the names of that have moved over to sign exchanges. I, I'm, I won't name drop them, but um, yeah, no, it is pretty neat. And I mean, it will work with any framework. Essentially, it's the, the little bit of code that, or stuff that you do need to set up, essentially middleware. So your, your server is serving stuff as a signed exchange rather than as a, you know, an HTML document. Great. Well, we are almost uh, running out of time here. So uh, maybe to close this out, uh, tell us, you know, you know, how people can get in contact with either of you or follow you online. Um, and maybe it'd, it'd be really useful you talk to Annie about that long process you guys went through on the studies of how you guys make the sausage of Coral Vitals. Uh, what's the best resource for developers who want to get involved in that process? Where should they go? Uh, to contribute and understand what's coming down the pipeline. Yeah, so Lightweight, uh, there's a web-vitals-feedback at googlegroups.com. You can just email us and give us your feedback in time. Ishan, I know you've already given us uh, feedback to that mailing list a couple times. This is awesome. Uh, and then uh, if you wanted to get more deeply involved, uh, we developed these standards to the web performance working group. So you can join the working group and uh, contribute at the meetings and uh, you know jump in the GitHub and whatnot. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for joining us on JavaScript Jam. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Awesome. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. Thank you.